Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming out despite this cold morning. I think we even have some standing room <laughs> um, members here in the audience. And um, as Dr. Fetcher mentioned, I am a radiation oncologist uh, who works closely with Drs. Lau, Dr. Fetcher, um, and with surgeons and with a variety of other doctors as part of a multidisciplinary team taking care of patients with cancer and specifically with melanoma. Just out of curiosity, with a show of hands, how many of you have some familiarity with radiation? Maybe know somebody who got radiation therapy, or maybe you yourself have received it. Anyone? So we have, that's a good number of people. Um, and, and so, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, it's kind of an abstract concept, I think, um, in the press and sort of when you look at the news, when we think about radiation therapy, people think about radiation poisoning, um, you know, from exposure to certain environmental toxins. Um, and they think about radiation, you know, so you see the biohazard signs and it's, it's not a good thing. Um, but as I will show you um, in overviewing what radiation therapy is and how it can be used to treat cancer, specifically for patients with melanoma, um, we'll come to see how this very specialized tool can be harnessed to do really, really um, helpful things for patients with cancer. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about what the fundamentals are of radiation therapy. Um, go over a few examples of how it can be used to treat patients with melanoma. And then, just as Dr. Fetcher did, emphasize the importance of multidisciplinary care for our patients. As a step back, um, not just specific to melanoma, but for cancer in general, most patients actually undergo a combination of treatments by several different types of physicians. That can include surgery, systemic therapy, as Dr. Lau mentioned, and radiation therapy. And it's about 50% of patients overall who will receive some form of radiation therapy as part of their treatment. So for patients with breast cancer, this is an important part after surgery that's used to kind of sterilize what was left behind. And it's often used in conjunction with chemotherapy to, in a complementary way, try to get rid of any cancer cells in the body. Sometimes it can be used as the primary treatment. So if there's areas you cannot surgically remove without really causing a lot of devastation to your body, for example, like your throat box, your voice box, your swallowing tubes, um, radiation is the primary treatment that can actually be used to melt away and kill cancer in these areas, but still have you keep those organs. For melanoma, Radiation is used for very specific indications, and we'll talk about examples of how it can be used. So radiation therapy um, is delivered generally through a machine that is known as a linear accelerator, an example of which is shown here. And what it does is that there are a number of high energy particles. You may remember from middle school or high school science these um, subatomic particles that are known as electrons, and we read about you know, protons and photons. Um, well, the, radi the way that radiation therapy is delivered is that these small charged particles are accelerated to very, very high energies. And in a very, very precise fashion, they're meant to hit this particular metal substance and then generate um, highly regulated forms and pockets of and pockets and waves of energy that can be harnessed in a very very precise way to treat cancer, cancer tumors that are as large as, for example, 20 centimeters in your pelvis or as large as two millimeters in your brain. And this machine, which weighs multiple tons, rotates in a very very precise fashion so that you can literally deliver this form of radiation treatment with submillimetric precision using modern technologies. How does it work? Well, we've heard a lot this morning about genes and gene editing and a lot of these medical terms. As you may also remember from your high school classes, genes are the backbone of all, of all cells in general. Every single cell in your body contains this blueprint called DNA or genes. For cancer in particular, it's very, very important um, in order for the cancer cells to continue to grow and to spread. 
And what radiation therapy fundamentally does, like many of our other treatments, such as chemotherapy, is that it damages the backbone or the genes of these cells. And in so doing, it basically kills off the cancer cells. Radiation therapy does this in a very specific and a very reliable manner. In fact, radiation is one of the most potent cancer-killing treatments that we have. It just has to be harnessed in the right way. It can either directly break the backbone by going into the areas that stick the building blocks together of, of these DNA pieces and literally just um, splice or, or, bake or introduce a breakage in those connections. Or believe it or not, it can actually interact with other molecules in the vicinity, such as water, and then generate these secondary substances that in turn lead to damage that kills the DNA of the cancer cells. So there's more than one way that it does this. But because it does it in such a highly precise and lethal fashion, cancer cells will usually die as a consequence of exposure to radiation. How often is radiation therapy given? Well, it can range. And for those of you who are familiar or know somebody who's received radiation treatment, it can be given in a single session that lasts about 12 minutes, where literally you can treat um, with what would be equivalent to like eight weeks of radiation in 12 minutes in a very, very precise manner to a two millimeter spot in the brain. Sometimes it's given over the course of one or two weeks for patients who have pain, for example, in their back, if melanoma has spread to their bones and they need to have some pain relief. And sometimes it's much more commonly, and this is probably the most common thing that we um, treat, is much more protracted over the course of four or six or sometimes eight weeks, delivering little deposits of radiation every single day in order to basically get rid of cancer in a particular organ. And this can be used, for example, when patients who have a melanoma that's spread to a lymph node basin and then they have it surgically removed, but are at a high risk, like Dr. Lau mentioned, risk of the cancer returning, they undergo radiation to help to sterilize and to reduce that risk. What are the side effects of radiation? Well, generally we think about the time course over which these can occur in terms of being within days or even a few weeks after radiation sometimes a few months after, but believe it or not, radiation effects can sometimes manifest many, many years later, sometimes a, like 12 months or a year later. In some patients, sometimes 15 years after exposure to the radiation. So it can be very, very latent, and it just depends on the kind of side effects it is. What kind of side effects can occur after radiation really depends on where the radiation is aimed. So we sometimes joke because, you know, sometimes we'll get questions if you have radiation, for example, to your neck area, and then someone's describing pain or maybe like an ulcer on their toe. We can tell you for sure that that's not due to the radiation. But we get that question, believe it or not, from other doctors who are wondering if the radiation caused that kind of effect. Most of the effects of radiation are related to exactly where the area was aimed, with the exception of some more general symptoms, such as tiredness, for example, or sometimes nausea. Even though you do radiation to the brain, some triggers in the brain can kind of start to tell you that you might feel nauseated, even though we're not giving radiation to your stomach, for example. And so examples of radiation um, that you may read about or that you may hear about if patients or friends of yours have undergone the treatment include being tired, um, perhaps having some hair loss in the area where the radiation is aimed, perhaps you could develop a rash or irritation or even something like a sunburn on the skin temporarily when the radiation is being given and for a few weeks after. It can lead to a sore throat or sometimes diarrhea if you're getting radiation in your bowel area, for example. Longer term, we think about possible effects from radiation maybe six months or 12 months later. And these are generally more uncommon um, or infrequent types of uh, side effects that can happen. But for patients who get radiation to the brain, they can sometimes experience some swelling in that area or sometimes even some um, irritation or even damage in some people. Some people can experience chronic joint stiffness. They can experience chronic changes in their bowels, so going to the bathroom a lot more often than they used to. Or maybe they have chronic trouble with, with swallowing after their treatment. So 
with that sort of overview of what radiation therapy is, how it's made, how it's given, and what kind of side effects we can experience, I wanted to go over a few examples of how radiation can be used for the treatment of melanoma. And I'll probably spend most of the discussion focusing on how it can be used to help patients who have brain tumors from melanoma, since that's my area of, of uh, expertise. For the body, um, as Dr. Fetcher had mentioned, sometimes radiation can be used in instances where we think there could be melanoma cells left behind, even after they've had a very thorough surgery. And so, for example, when patients, and this was an example of a patient who had a melanoma that had spread to the lymph nodes, kind of in the left axillary or under the arm area, and the red area, the red arrow depicts kind of large bulky lymph nodes that you're not seeing on the opposite side of the body. After the surgical removal, they found that instead of just being in the lymph node capsule, it had actually started to spread a little bit beyond that into the fatty areas in the surrounding area. And whenever we see that or other examples of risk factors that could mean even if you had a really great surgery, we couldn't get all the cells that might have been spilled or left behind if the tumors are too large, if there are too many of them, for example, or if they're just not staying contained in their area, then we sometimes think about giving radiation in order to sterilize those areas. And in fact, medical trials have actually tested this and tried to determine if it can keep the cancer from coming back specifically in that area and found that in some patients, it can be helpful helpful. We're learning more and more about this because, as has already been mentioned, there's just year by year and certainly in a five-year period, so many advancements in the treatment of melanoma um, that a lot of these paradigms are constantly changing and how we think about combining these therapies to help keep the cancer away are constantly changing. But this is an example of how radiation has been used um, in the body. A radiation field, kind of a general large radiation field, might look something like this on an x-ray. And a radiation plan, when a radiation oncologist is looking at a patient's CT scan and they're looking at the bones and the muscles and the nerves and what all needs to be treated, would look something like this, where the lines, the colored lines are kind of depicting if you can imagine like a topographic map that tells you different elevations, um, the highest elevation is kind of like more like the center or uh, central color, so more like the blue is the highest dose. And then as you get further and further out from there, there's lower doses. And this is exactly how radiation is planned and devised and ultimately treated. And this is an example of how that particular patient was treated in order to help to sterilize that area. I'm going to shift gears and focus most of this remaining discussion on how radiation can be treat, used to treat a very specific situation from melanoma, because sometimes some patients can experience um, tumors that spread from the primary, uh, from the original melanoma site and somehow found a way to um, get into the brain. Um, and in some instances, um, you know, the when we are um, working together with our colleagues, such as Dr. Fetcher and Dr. Lau, patients may need to have radiation treatment for the brain. The reason that radiation has been the main treatment actually for patients who have brain tumors and the past is because a lot of our therapies don't really get into the brain very easily. So regular chemotherapies, the body is designed to kind of push that out of the brain and surgery you know, brain surgery is a very, very big deal. And a lot of people may not be strong enough to have brain surgery, or maybe the tumor just can't be removed. The surgeon can't find it. It's too small. It's just too deep and it's not safe to remove. So most patients actually would in the past have received some form of radiation that looked something like this. So as you can see, this is kind of a very crude um, uh, image where basically you can see the entire skull and the brain is contained in there. And it was like 50 years ago or something that people were giving, getting radiation, um, what was known as whole brain radiation or treating the entire brain, because that's basically all we had available. We really couldn't tell where the tumors were, but you were guaranteed not to miss the tumor if you treated the entire brain. And then you could also um, treat other areas that besides where you could see the cancer, where other areas of cancer may be hiding. 
Fast forward now to 2019, and the treatment paradigm for patients who have brain tumors from melanoma has really, really um, has really, really changed. And it's very complicated. This is sort of what goes through the mind of an oncologist, specifically a radiation oncologist, when they're caring for patients who have brain tumors from melanoma, thinking about, okay, you know, this could be a possible option. This may be the op uh, next best option. What are the best combination of options? Not just to help to kill, kill the cancer and to make the cancer go away, but also what's going to be best for them long term in terms of their quality of life and their Function. And there have been a lot of efforts over the last five to 10 years really trying to figure out how can we do better with our treatments? How can we reduce the side effects that happen from the radiation that we give? I think one of the biggest questions that I get asked when we're talking about brain radiation, which is a very natural question is, well, is this going to make my thinking differently, different? Is it going to make me have dementia or just change who I am as a person? And in the past, um, when we didn't have many available tools, there were some people when they had brain radiation that could have especially a little bit of slowing in their memory, for example. So they would put the keys down on the counter, and then 20 minutes later, they would be trying to remember, where did I put those keys? Or, you know, what did I do with this or that? And so we've tried to tackle this from a variety of ways. One of the ways we've tried to ch tackle this problem is by figuring out, are there drug therapies that can be used to protect patients' memories when they're getting brain radiation to the entire brain? There was a medical trial that was recently conducted for patients, not just with melanoma brain metastases, but all brain metastases, where basically patients were, by the flip of a coin, assigned to placebo or if they should receive this medication that's an FDA-approved medication for Alzheimer's disease called memantine or nemenda, which has a very specific effect in the brain, but as you can imagine, is often used to preserve memory. And it was found that in terms of helping pre preserve their cognition, in particular their memory, that there seemed to be an advantage to the giving of the memantine, which is the dark line, indicating that there was less of a risk that the patient would have cognitive issues after giving radiation to the whole brain than if they didn't get that medication. Beyond just trying to find medications that help patients, we also have been trying to capitalize on our technologies. So we are well, well advanced now um, and much farther ahead than we were when we were just giving radiation to the entire brain uh, with very, very simple techniques. Nowadays, there are technologies available that are, are being investigated that can specifically be used to carve out regions of the brain that we think contain important regions that are uh, helpful for memory formation and that contain stem cells in order to help with memory formation. So an example of a structure such as this is called the hippocampus, um, which is located on both sides of your brain. And there are emerging techniques in radiation therapy where you can use very sophisticated algorithms to basically treat all the surrounding brain, but try to specifically spare that region. And believe it or not, not only is that something that's achievable, but we're starting to develop early evidence that that might also, on top of the memantine medication, be helpful for preserving memory for patients who get radiation to their whole brain from brain metastases. But perhaps the most commonly used advancement, I'd have to say, and this is a, a, um, an area that many of you may have heard of, is the general move away from giving whole brain radiation to all patients to very, very precise forms of radiation called radiosurgery. And this is something that we commonly do for patients, particularly with melanoma, if they have a few number of lesions, such as this one, which had a single metastasis on the right side of the brain, seen, as, uh, seen on the left side of the screen there. And the reason that we do that is because similarly, there's been a lot of medical trials where we're really trying to dig down and figure out how can we better improve you know, the cognition and the memory and how well patients are able to concentrate on their tasks and their day-to-day -day life um, instead of giving the whole brain radiation. And they did very detailed testing and medical trials to look at this and basically found that as the red curve represents, um, 
as opposed to getting the whole brain radiation where you were more likely to have cognitive decline if you got the radio surgery, which is a very focused, precise, more limited form of radiation, which is the blue curve, that you would be less likely to experience that. And this is why this is our standard practice for patients who have very, very limited numbers of lesions that we can basically take care of with focused radiation and not have to expose the rest of the brain. And this is an example of what such a plan would look like. These are very complex plans, but they yield um, generally a, a lot better sparing, a tremendously amount more sparing of the brain than if you were to use whole brain radiation. So finally, I'd like to also emphasize that as we've talked a lot about treatment and treatment and treatment, how um, important, as has been mentioned, um, as we think about how patients are feeling longer term, six months later, a year after their treatment, and what ways we can better enhance the therapies that we give from that perspective as well. So not just the surgery, the radiation, the chemo at the time of treatment, but especially for patients, as I found, who have brain tumors, for example, we really try to focus on, you know, if they have had problems after, for example, brain surgery, and then a combination of radiation and chemo, maybe we need to consider involving our neuropsychology colleagues to help um, think of basically, it's almost like mental gymnastic type exercises that you can do to strengthen your mind and your memory, um, speech therapy, and sometimes even physical medicine or rehabilitation to make sure that we can optimize their quality of life. And so in this talk, I've basically reviewed what radiation therapy is, what research, recent advances have been used to try to improve the therapies that were given and how important it is to involve all members of the patient's team. And I really want to thank you for your attention.